This is Bible Academy. Today we continue a survey of the Old Testament and we'll be looking at the book of Zechariah. Now before we get started, as usual, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for this privilege and opportunity to study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Zechariah, the purpose to provide a teaching for troubled times, to rebuke the people for the perpetuation of the evil ways and deeds of their ancestors. To exhort the people to repent and return to God in a renewed covenant relationship that demonstrated social justice. To encourage the people and offer hope for the future with promises of God's blessing and restoration. Major themes. Messiah and Old Testament eschatology. God's presence. The book of Zechariah opens with a vision of the Lord on a red horse. We see that in one eight. In that same area of scripture, the Lord will return to the temple when it is rebuilt in Jerusalem. Later, he will be a wall of fire around Jerusalem and the glory within it in 2.5. The Lord also says he will return to Zion and dwell in Jerusalem. The Lord will stand on the Mount of Olives at his return. We see this later in the book. That brings us to the outline. Now, this book is often broken up into at least two, if not three parts by biblical scholars. There's a reason for that. There's a big change in the way he writes about halfway through the book. I'll explain that later on as we get into some of our structure, that type of thing. But for right now, let's understand there's two parts, breaking the book up into two halves. Part one is chapters one through eight. Introduction, call to national repentance. Two, eight night visions. One, horsemen among the myrtle trees. Two, four horns and four craftsmen. Three, the surveyor. Four, the investiture of Joshua. Five, gold lampstand and olive trees. Six, the flying scroll. Seven, woman in the basket. Eight, four chariots. That's all eight visions. And then he does a sign act with the crowning of Joshua. Zechariah's messages. <clears throat> this is section three, the two messages, justice, mercy, and fasting, and promise of the future. That brings us to part two, chapters nine through 14, basically the second half of the book. The major prophecies, the first and second advent. So we see both of those in the second half of the book. The first prophecy, under that we see the Messiah King and his rule, the redemption of Israel, Messiah King rejected. B, the second prophecy, Israel's enemies destroyed, Israel cleansed, the shepherd and the sheep, and then the day of the Lord. The introduction. Now, we've just studied Haggai. If you've done Haggai before this, then you're up to snuff on this. You should be aware of some of this background of what's going on. <clears throat> People are back in the land. And uh, they have not got the temple built. They've wasted a lot of time, a number of years. And Zechariah and Haggai are raised by God to get them going. 
uh, not just back on the temple and get it completed, but get them going spiritually. Here we go. Zechariah and Haggai were complementary post-exilic prophets. Zechariah was the younger and began prophesying about two months after Haggai's brief ministry. While Haggai called on the people to erect the temple of God, Zechariah summoned the community to repentance and spiritual renewal. His task was to prepare the people for proper worship and temple service once the temple was completed. Zechariah means Yahweh remembers, which is at the core of his message to Jerusalem after the exile. He's identified as the son of Berechiah and the grandson of Iddo, verse 1-1. But the word for son could also mean any descendant, but I take it as the grandson. The name Zechariah appears 32 times in Scripture, leaving it open to misidentification. I put this in here to let you know there's a lot of Zechariahs in Scripture. Make sure you don't get the wrong one when you uh, see the name Zechariah. Just remember that. That's true of a lot of well-known biblical names. There's, uh, it was a common name. Many people used it. So one must be careful not to confuse him with others. Often they'll identify him as a son of someone else that's not Berechiah, so you know that's not our Zechariah here, for example. According to Nehemiah, Zechariah's grandfather Iddo returned to Jerusalem from the Babylonian captivity with Zerubbabel and Joshua. Now, Joshua was the NIV translation. The other translation, some of them are going to say Jeshua. All right. Elsewhere, Nehemiah lists Zechariah as the head of the priestly family of Iddo. This means Zechariah was a member of the tribe of Levi and served in Jerusalem as both a priest and prophet. So he had some very good credentials. It's writing. <clears throat> The pronouncements in the first half of the book were proclaimed during the reign of the Persian king Darius, 521 to 486, from 20 to 518 BC. So that's when the pronouncements took place from 520 to 518 in the first half of the book. When he wrote them down, it's difficult to determine, since there is no mention of the temple rebuilt in the first eight chapters. One may accept these sayings as spoken before its completion, so we're certainly before 516. The date of the remaining pronouncements in part two, the second half of the book, are also difficult to determine. Conservative scholars ascribe them to Zechariah in the latter part of his life. They often cite the failure of the Persian expedition against Greece under King Xerxes as the event prompting the prophecies of chapter 9 through 14. So, we see Persia in trouble. They also see the similarities in style, theme, vocabulary, and theology, while attributing the differences to his older age and the changing historical and political situation of Persia. The final draft of the book was probably completed between 500 and 470 BC. Like Haggai's prophecy, Zechariah's messages originated in Jerusalem and were intended for the people of post-exilic Jerusalem and its environs. The spiritual apathy, despair, and sense of hopelessness pervading the early post-exilic period of Hebrew history provided the motivation behind Zechariah's exhortations and predictions. So the people are in a down mood. We'll talk about that a little bit later. <clears throat> The background. The backdrop of Zechariah's prophecy, like Haggai's, was the reign of Darius I, king of Persia. Even though the Hebrews had returned from Babylon, there was little evidence of any covenant restoration that Yahweh had promised Jerusalem. In other words, there was no signs that things were getting better. Things were getting better. Things were not going well. Only a few of the ten thousands had returned. The walls were in ruins. The temple was a heap of rubble, and blight was upon the land. Judah had just switched masters, now under Persian rule. The surrounding nations continued to harass the leaders in Jerusalem and thwart what little effort they attempted to improve their situation. 
selfishness, gloom, and despair dominated the mood. In response to this situation, God raised up two prophets, one to get the building process going again, and the other to inspire the people to spiritual renewal. Haggai was called to exhort and challenge the Hebrew community to rebuild the temple. He prophesied for only four months in 520 BC. Even so, the people responded to his message and began the reconstruction of the temple. Zechariah complimented Haggai's message by calling for a spiritual revival among the people. His ministry began just two months after Haggai's, and his last dated message was delivered in 518 BC, his ministry just lasting over two years. Ezra <clears throat> writes of both of their contributions, both Zechariah and Haggai's. Ezra 5, 1 and 2. Now Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet, a descendo of a descendant rather of Iddo, prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, son of Sheotel, and Joshua, son of Josedek, set to work to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. So here you have uh, Zerubbabel, the uh, priest Joshua, uh, and two prophets as a team, you might say, trying to get the people back on course with God. Get the temple built, start proper worship. Well, the temple was completed and rededicated to the worship of Yahweh with the celebration of the Passover feast in 515 B.C. Purpose and message. Zechariah's message includes rebuke, exhortation, and encouragement. He first tried to get the community to turn from their evil ways of their ancestors. They stood guilty like those who had been sent into exile. Isn't that interesting? Not much has changed. He called for repentance, which could lead to true worship in a rebuilt temple being urged on by Haggai. Only obedience to the voice of the Lord would bring in the long-awaited blessing, prosperity, and righteousness of the Messianic age. If they were to see blessing as promised, they would have to start living the covenant life and show it in their behavior. Some scripture. Then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, Thus has the Lord of hosts said, Dispense true justice, and practice kindness and compassion each to his brother. And do not oppress the widow or the orphan, the stranger or the poor, and do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. Policies reflecting these applications would help any nation in their relationship with God. And that is this is what they call the biblical social justice, not the stuff they throw around today and misuse it and misapply it. But when you're properly applying justice in the social realm, there is really justice. The courts are fair. The judges are fair. Uh, the laws are right. They're just law enforcement is doing its job correctly. And notice some of the applications. There's justice, there's kindness. People are just kind to each other. When did, when's the last time you experienced that all around you? And compassion, each to his brother. And taking care of the widows and orphans, the stranger or the poor. And there wasn't people always plotting evil against someone else. And you see that all over the place. In just about every realm. Not just politics. 
Once the people of Israel started seeking the Lord, then other nations would come to him. That was supposed to be the pattern. Once Israel got right with God, then other nations would come to God with the help of Israel. We don't see that till the end of the chapter. Then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. Now this only happens in the Millennial Kingdom. Zechariah also sought to comfort and strengthen the people of Judah and Jerusalem. These words of comfort came in several forms. Zechariah was given visions which reminded the people that God still ruled the nations for the ultimate benefit of his elect in Zion. Um, I have recently went over some of those visions again in, in our study at home. And uh, I go in a lot of detail to bring out uh, what I think needs to be brought out. And you see the encouragement in the prophetic uh, oracles of Zechariah. And these oracles and their future application not just, just don't only apply to the Israel and their dire situation, but they apply to you and me because they speak about Christ coming back and establishing his kingdom. That's part of it. And he will be the um, king, our high priest. He'll, have, he'll be wearing all these hats that just benefit us. They benefit us. He will be our ruler. What a wonderful thing to have a perfect, righteous, and just ruler over us. Not to mention all the great laws that are in effect. Zechariah 4 6. So he said to me, This is the word of the Lord is Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. The spirit will be moving like we've never seen in that kingdom of God on earth. Zechariah often referred to the words of former prophets, which both authenticated his own ministry and assured the people that the covenant promises were still intact. They were not to despair, but continued to trust and believe what they had been told by the prophets. Structure and Organization the book is divided in two parts. You mentioned that earlier. The first begins with the introductory verse and the call to repentance, the seven night visions, and the two oracles addressing the topic of fasting. The second part consists of eschatological oracles subdivided into two sections, the word of the Lord concerning Hadrach and the word of the Lord concerning Israel. The literary patterns indicate deliberate structuring of the themes and argues for the unity of the entire work. It also supports that Zechariah not only composed the work but also arranged and edited his own visions and oracles. Zechariah's call to repentance complements Haggai's charge to rebuild the temple. The building of the temple was to be corresponding to the spiritual renewal. The night vision supported his claim that God will return to Israel. The visions revealed that God would bring to peace, would bring peace to Israel, that there would be retribution to those nations who scattered Israel, the restoration of the city of Jerusalem, divinely appointed leadership, a purging of evil from the people of God and the establishment of covenant righteousness in Zion. The two sermons on fasting connected the pursuit of social justice in the current age with the eventual reversal of Judah's fortunes among the nations in the age to come. As Judah sought the favor of the Lord, so too the nations would one day seek the Lord in Jerusalem. The two eschatological oracles lifted the hopes of the community by depicting the promised future kingdom of God. 
The literary genre of the book is oracular prose, a combination of prose and poetry, which we see in prophetic literature. Other literary forms that we see in the book here, exhortation with repentance oracle, with a repentance oracle, narrative in the form of vision, prediction with revelation and interpretation formulas, inquiry with instructional response, symbolic actions, admonition with messenger and date formula, divine oracles of judgment and salvation. So you wouldn't really probably pick up on these uh, unless you go with with uh, through this in a study with with me or someone else that goes into the detail but I don't bring them out unless I think they have some real relevance and can help us but this survey helps you know that these things are in there uh, it is amazing uh, if not really remarkable that these um, prophets could write with such skill Zechariah, his writings are also classified as proto-apocalyptic. Do you remember that word? We saw it in Ezekiel. Like Ezekiel, they are highly, there are highly symbolic representations. So not all the book is typical apocalyptic like we have in prominent, we have prominent other prophetic writings. So he is one of the books that has this proto-apocalyptic type of symbols. Highly symbolic. All right. Major themes. Our first one is the Messiah. Zechariah has a lot to say about the Messianic shepherd king, second only to Isaiah. We will examine those that are used in the New Testament drawn from the book of Zechariah. So that's why we're doing this. We're going to see what the New Testament writers use that talk about the uh, Messiah. Some of these will be very familiar, especially if you studied one of the Gospels with me recently. He comes in a low and humble station of life. Now the 9-9 is in Zechariah and of course Matthew 21-5 is your New Testament passage. That continues to be the pattern here. He restores Israel by the blood of the covenant. He shepherds a people scattered, wandering as sheep. He's pierced and struck down. You see that a couple of times in Zechariah 12.10 and 13.7. He returns in glory, delivers Israel from her enemies, 14.1 through 6. His rule as king in peace, a king in peace and righteousness in Jerusalem. And he establishes a new world order. Yes, a new world order. Christ is king. That's the only type of new world order we should be looking forward to. <clears throat> Old Testament eschatology. Now this is just from Zechariah. Now I arrange these and you will see they're not only in order of what they are in the book of Zechariah, but and I'm not saying on this is 100% true, but I think it's in order the, the way these things happen chronologically in the future. Well, let's go through them and we can confirm that, I think, even further. So these are the summer major teachings, some of the major teachings that Zechariah has about prophecy. <clears throat> and folks, these are all big ones, especially regards regarding Israel. Israel be saved, 916. The Lord their God will save his people on that day as a shepherd saves his flock. They will sparkle in his land like jewels in a crown. Does that mean every single Jew? No. But as a people, from my understanding, it'd be the largest majority of them will be saved. Two, the regathering and restoration of Israel on the day of the Lord. Zechariah 10, 9 and 10. Though I scatter them among the peoples, yet in distant lands they will remember me. They and their children will survive, and they will return. 
I will bring them back from Egypt and gather them from Assyria. I will bring them to Gilead and Lebanon, and there will not be enough be room enough for them. So a huge amount of Jewish people come back into the land. Three. Deliverance would come by a shepherd king who will first be rejected and struck down. Now, we understand this, and I was talking about the order earlier, okay? This, of course, has to do with his first advent. But the deliverance of this struck down shepherd in the first advent, of course, will come when he comes back again. So you kind of got two th timing things going on here. Zechariah 13, 7, Awake sword against my shepherd, against the man who is close to me, declares the Lord Almighty. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered and I will turn my hand against the little ones. Now, this has to do with uh, when Christ was crucified and you see the people of Israel scatter. Basically, that's the idea. All right, now, the point here is deliverance is going to come from this one that was struck. But he will bring him back, as we just saw, with the point previously. Right here, I will bring them to Gilead. Okay, I will bring them back from Egypt and gather them from Assyria. So what we're saying here, though this happens next in sequence, he was actually struck down earlier in the first advent. So in that way, it's still in order. Four, his ministry will be one of peace and reconciliation and cleansing by the Holy Spirit. Zechariah 12, 9 and 10. And in that day, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace, I see that as the Holy Spirit, and supplication. And they will look to me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. And this is my translation. The reason I put mine in here is because some of your more popular modern translations uh, do not have spirit capitalized. And I see that as the Spirit of God. Some translations do. Number five, Judah and Israel will again be united into one Israel with the restoration of fortunes to the elect. All this will come to pass after the nations have waged war against Jerusalem, only to be vanquished by the Lord. There's your verses. Let's look at 14, 1 through 5. So we have a uniting of Judah and Israel, that is, as the northern kingdom, they come together as the one Israel. A day of the Lord is coming, Jerusalem, when your possessions will be plundered, invited, and divided within your very walls. I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. This is basically the Armageddon campaign, by the way. The city will be captured, the houses ransacked, and the women raped. Half of the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. So the Mount of Olives basically splits. The people escape through that valley. Verse 5 tells us that you will flee by my mountain valley, for it will extend to Azel. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. Then the battle uh, begins with Jesus engaging the enemy with his holy ones. Well, later after that, we have number six. The Lord's restoration of Israel is to culminate in the establishment of the new created order and the Lord himself will rule over the earth. There will be a new Jerusalem and the wealth of the nations will pour into Zion. Let's look at verses 9 and 14. That's a pretty good section there. We'll look at a couple of the verses. 
The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day there will be one Lord, and his name the only name. 14. Judah too will fight at Jerusalem. The wealth of all the surrounding nations will be collected. Great quantities of gold and silver and clothing. So the riches start pouring into Israel. <clears throat> Here's something you would expect. Seven, the temple. The temple is prominent in the restored city of David. The temple will stand as a symbol of peace, righteousness, and holiness that will characterize the kingdom of God. Zechariah 14, 16. Then the survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, and to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Verse 20. On that day, holy to the Lord will be inscribed on the bells of the horses and the cooking pots in the Lord's house will be like the sacred bowls in front of the altar. Verse 21. Every pot in Jerusalem and Judah will be holy to the Lord Almighty, and all who come to sacrifice will take some of the pots and cook in them, and on that day there will, be, there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord Almighty. Uh, I don't think I noted this at the beginning of our notes, but when you see these underlined uh, scripture quotes, uh, that is with NIV 11. I've been trying to be consistent with that in the last few lessons. If you don't see those underlines, it's something else, and I'll try to remember to note that. Final comments. Let's just talk about what we just looked at in Zechariah. Zechariah's teachings are consistent with both the rest of the Old Testament and the New Testament. However, the events comprising the first and second advents, including the day of the Lord, were so compressed, or I should say are so compressed and condensed that many later interpreters blurred the distinctions into one coming. The Jewish people continue to be hardened to Jesus Christ, being the Messiah and the Savior, and looking for the first coming of the Son of David. And this blending and the failure to distinguish between the advents is part of their problem. But the biggest problem is having an open heart to God and turning to Christ as the Messiah. From that point, so, in the future, however, in the future, when Jesus Christ returns towards the end of the Battle of Armageddon, many Jews will see and understand their grave error and turn to him as Lord and Savior. He will deliver them as a people and then bring the believers into his kingdom that he will establish on earth. Israel will once again be the central nation in that kingdom. Jesus will rule from the temple in Jerusalem on Mount Zion. Israel as a people will enjoy the presence of God in that kingdom. And these principles I just stated, many of these are in Zechariah. So the visions and the teaching and the sayings of, of Zechariah are to give these people hope in troubled time. Remember the situation. They needed some spiritual renewal at a very difficult time. The crops weren't coming in. People are discouraged. The temple's not built. In fact, it's still in, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, I was going to say crumbles, but that's not how we usually say it. But it's still in ruins, okay? It still had to be rebuilt. Well, that ends the book of Zechariah. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we do thank you for your word today. Challenge us with what we've heard. Help us sort these things out correctly to be get, get a better understanding of this great book. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.